Uh, good afternoon. I'm John Walters. Uh, I'm Chief Operating Officer here at Help Hudson. I'd like to welcome you to uh, Hudson Institute and the Betsy and Wally Stern Policy Center. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, a session that uh, will take a break from some of the pressing policy and political matters. Uh, uh, one of my family's favorite movies is Apollo 13, and some of you who watched the movie will remember the point where everybody's panicking because the spacecraft is falling apart, and uh, <laughs> flight, director, flight director Gene Kranz stops everybody, played by Ed Harris, and says, all right, let's start with what's working on the spacecraft. And, uh, so uh, today we're going to uh, take a breath and, and talk a little bit about what uh, deep uh, wellsprings of strength uh, this country has continued to operate on for so long, and it's because uh, we have this opportunity as a result of our senior fellow, uh, Melanie Kirkpatrick, who's uh, written a new book, uh, which will be available for those who want to buy it here uh, on Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, the holiday at the heart of the American experience. Uh, Melanie is a, a esteemed colleague here, a senior fellow. Um, she has been, uh, and I will, I will, one of the things to be thankful for is I will not take a lot of time and therefore I will not do justice entirely to Melanie and Kimberly's backgrounds, but um, she has worked for a long time as a distinguished journalist, writer, uh, um, edited, uh, and has gone back and edited uh, uh, now uh, uh, material at the Wall Street Journal. She's also been someone who has cared deeply about uh, uh, human rights in the world, which is not always an easy thing, although everybody says they like it, it's a tough fight. And uh, I want to mention her book, uh, uh, Escape from North Korea, The Untold Story of Asians Under Asia's Underground Railroad. She's kept the focus on this and a lot of other areas of, of human rights abuse that uh, we ought to pay more attention to. So I want to thank her for that, as well as for this wonderful new book that uh, I hope you all will uh, enjoy with your families this, this holiday season. Uh, uh, Melanie has a bachelor's degree from Princeton University and a master's degree in literature from um, uh, University of Toronto. Uh, as I said, she has served on uh, a number of boards and um, organizations, including Human Fre Freedom Advisory Council at the George W. Bush Center. And uh, she is uh, also um, uh, married to our esteemed trustee and senior fellow, Jack David, who I'm pleased to say is here with us. Uh, Kimberly Strauss will join her in this conversation. For many people, she doesn't need any introduction. She's, uh, if, you, if you watch television on Sunday morning, uh, you will see her frequently. You read her regularly in the Wall Street Journal, her Potomac Watch column. She is a Bradley Award winner in 2014. She has uh, taken on the uh, difficult questions as well that uh, we need to face in the country. And of course, uh, sometimes that's a thankless job as well. Um, but uh, um, her book, The Intimidation Game, How the Left is Silencing Free Speech, is also an important uh, book for our time and talks about some of the challenges that we will face. But today we're going to take a break from um, uh, the, the uh, immediate uh, uh, threats and talk about the deep wellsprings of strength and the things that we uh, uh, can all be thankful for that are the blessings of the United States at this holiday season. So without any more ado, I'll turn it over to Melanie and Kimberly. Well, welcome everyone. Um, we're here to talk about Thanksgiving, giving thanks, and I want to start by thanking Melanie, giving my thanks. Melanie wrote this book because it is absolutely wonderful. It has the most amazing stories in it. It's informative. It's absolutely charming. Uh, it's also incredibly uplifting, and at this moment where many of us wish that we could all be put into an induced coma until November 9th, <laughs> or maybe even longer than that. It, it was it, such a, a joy to read something that made you feel very good about this country. I read it twice. And so, by the way, go out. Don't just buy one for yourself. Buy 10. Give them to your in-laws. They're great Christmas presents. Um, you, you, will, you will not regret it. Um, I wanted to start and talk a little bit just to set the scene about Thanksgiving. If you, if you look out there, Melanie, and, and you address this in the book, there are millions of Americans, and we have this set idea of Thanksgiving in our head. Uh, you know, you're landing on Pil um, Plymouth Rock, and the, the uh, pilgrims and the Indians, and they're sitting there. There's that famous Jenny Brownscombe painting of, of the man praying at the head of the table. One of the things that was most interesting to me just reading this book was that 
most of our perceptions about what that very first Thanksgiving was like are not really probably historically accurate. So before we even begin talking about the sort of history of Thanksgiving, talk about what actually happened on that day. What were they gathered there to do? What were they, in fact, giving thanks for? Uh, we probably didn't have any Indians in headdresses. Uh, they probably weren't sitting together, the men and women eating their dinners. Set the scene for that first Thanksgiving. Well, I'll be happy to do that in a moment, but first I would like to give my thanks to you, Kim, mm -hmm. for uh, joining us today and also put a plug for your magnificent <laughs> book, The Imitation Game, The Intimidation Game. If you haven't read it, please do. It's just spectacular. And I would like to give a special thanks to Hudson, to John Walters, to Ken Weinstein, who couldn't be here today, and thank them very much for their support as I pursued this project. And finally, one special thanks to uh, a Hudson Senior Fellow and Trustee, my husband, who uh, is also Jack David, who's also my uh, first editor and my best editor. He never let me get away with anything, so <laughs> I'm, it's a stronger book, thanks to Jack. But to your question, Kim, um, the famous picture that you mentioned is one that all of you have probably seen. It's on many calendars and appears in lots of Thanksgiving materials. But it shows um, a group of pilgrims seated at an outdoor table. And um, uh, there are Indians wearing headdresses with them. And uh, it's a beautiful day. And the pilgrims are all dressed in dark, somber co colors, et cetera, et cetera. And none of that is really true, except maybe for the beautiful day and the fact that the, the, uh, the event was held outdoors. Instead, uh, the pilgrims wore vivid colors, in part because a black dye was more expensive than uh, <laughs> bright colored dyes. But um, the uh, women would have not eaten with the men. And in fact, there were only four pilgrim women. And this is an amazing statistic. Um, 18 women came um, on the Mayflower. But uh, and a number of the men, there was a larger number of men but who left their wives at home. But 18 women arrived, and only four lived till the time of the first Thanksgiving. Um, and to me, that is the most astonishing thing about the Pilgrim story. We all know that, but uh, they were there first and foremost in this three-day harvest feast um, to, um, you know, behind it all would have been a sense of thanks and gratitude that they had made it as far as this. The uh, Indians who were with them far outnumbered the Pilgrims. Um, so that's another I image that's a little different from the one we usually are aware of. There were 90 Indian men uh, who came to the first feast, and uh, there were about um, 30, I can't remember the exact number now, there were about 30 pilgrims, including the children, there. And um, you can just imagine this, that how scary it must have been <laughs> for some of the pilgrims to know, because they didn't really know these, um, the Wampanoan men. They'd had a positive relationship with them for uh, the months, nearly a year, 10 months or so probably, that uh, they'd been there. But they didn't really know them. And so we know from one of the eyewitness accounts of the first Thanksgiving that um, uh, one of the entertainments was the um, pilgrim men exercising their arms, was the phrase they used. And it was probably enjoyable to see that, but it also was a warning <laughs> to the, the Indians, a reminder that uh, these guys were dangerous. Because they, they didn't have a fort at that time. Um, they later had a debate about whether or not to build one, and they decided to do so. But uh, they were very much, the, the pilgrims were very exposed uh, at that point. But the biggest difference, Kim, was um, that uh, for the pilgrims, if you had asked them what they were doing, they would not have said, this is a Thanksgiving. Um, be, because... Um, Although the pilgrims gave thanks every day, 
um, and they would have given thanks during the course of this three-day feast, they would not have called it Thanksgiving Day. For them, their first Thanksgiving Day took place two years later, in July of 1623, when they um, uh, had an official day of worship for, in, um, to give thanks to God for a um, rainfall that had saved their crop. Well, in that regard, you, you have a fascinating history in here that if you're looking at it uh, through that lens about a, a day of worship and thanks for creating or making it through some perilous journey or uh, having God intercede on behalf of, of them, you can make the case that there are probably other places in North America that lay claim to the first Thanksgiving, yes. which would not be in Plymouth in Massachusetts. What are some of those? True. This was a, a lot of fun to research. Uh, there are several places that claim to be the, the first Thanksgiving and uh, have given um, Massachusetts a, a hard time about it over the years. <laughs> and um, one of, uh, there are a couple in Texas. Uh, uh, there are um, there's there are a couple in Florida, and there's one in Virginia. And I'll I'll talk about that one that if I may, yeah. because um, my friend Marshall Miller, who's sitting back there, is the one who in, who uh, called my attention to uh, the Berkeley Plantation Thanksgiving. And there's a wonderful story there. Um, in, uh, I think it was 1607, a group of settlers set out from England with the um, mandate of settling um, a large number of acres along the James River. And when they arrived, the first thing they did was give thanks. Uh, they literally w were at their captain told them to, when they reached shore to kneel and give thanks, and they had a ceremony. And it turned out that it, the um, instructions under which th this colony was approved included the uh, order that they give thanks every year on the day of their arrival. So they did. And then they did, it, uh, they did this the second year, and then the third year, um, their uh, community was attacked, and most of the settlers were killed by Indians. And so they eventually closed up and went back to England. Well, now, this, that, this was, I think, 1609 by now. So fast forward to the 1920s, and the um, retired president of William and Mary College was in New York City at the public library doing some research. And lo and behold, he came upon this document that nobody had known about before, ordering the um, men of um, Berkeley Plantation to give thanks every year on an annual basis. So he wrote an article for the Richmond newspaper saying, this is the real, real Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Um, so other people in Virginia took it up, uh, and in 1963, two, Kennedy issued, uh, as any president, every president does, the Thanksgiving Proclamation. He mentioned Massachusetts as being the site of the first Thanksgiving. Well, a Virginia state senator objected, sent a telegram to Kennedy, uh, and um, Kennedy asked his assistant to reply. Well, his assistant was Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., who wrote back and said, uh, confessed that the White House had a New England bias and that they were absolutely right. Virginia was the site of the first Thanksgiving, and they would correct it. And next year, in Kennedy's Thanksgiving proclamation, he mentioned Virginia first and then Massachusetts. Yeah, this is something you will love about this book is you would have no idea the controversy surrounding Thanksgiving over the years. <laughs> That's just one small one. We're going to get to some more. But tell us about the beginning, though, of this becoming a tradition um, for Father's Day and sort of the movement on mm -hmm. uh, up to the point at which we have a, a 
the United States of America and George Washington? Well, the religious tra uh, tradition of giving thanks um, started uh, well in, in all the colonies. Uh, all, everybody brought this religious tradition with them, and their days of thanksgiving being called uh, throughout the 13 colonies. But in um, 1636, Connecticut did something a little different. And uh, it was a step toward the holiday we know today. It, the civil authorities, not a religious uh, group, the civil authorities called a day of Thanksgiving. And they called it not for a specific reason, but for what they called general blessings. That is, continuing bless blessings, everyday blessings. And so on September 18th, 1636, the people of the colony of Connecticut had their first um, Thanksgiving Day, and then it continued as the years went by. Well, in the 17th century, this actually turned out to be another controversy. Mm -hmm. And uh, th there were theological arguments about whether you could really hold a day of general Thanksgiving without taking blessings for granted. Mm -hmm. And uh, Massachusetts um, refused to issue a uh, proclamation for a day of Thanksgiving until the end of the 17th century. It was the last holdout, <laughs> last holdout. So, so we, we begin to see this happening in states, though. Yeah, yeah. Having... and one other thing I should have mentioned is that the pilgrims brought with them a tradition of having a communal meal with Thanksgiving. And uh, this is really important because um, a communal meal was um, part, often part of the holiday. And sometime toward the end of the 17th century, the meal began to take on special meaning. And... Um, uh, Communities would have worship services in the mornings, but they dropped the worship services in the evenings because uh, people, uh, so that people could enjoy uh, being together with their families and having this meal. Also hugely controversial. Yes. 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 There were a lot of ministers that were not happy mm -hmm. about the religion being put aside mm -hmm. for food. Mm -hmm. um, but we begin to get some uh, coherence around a day in November. We have... Talk, talk about Forefathers Day, just because that oh, does right, do, right. play a, <clears throat> yeah, well, a big role in, in when we now celebrate Thanksgiving. Has anybody ever heard of Forefathers Day? No. No, everybody's forgotten it. Uh, <laughs> it was a holiday that um, celebrated the landing of the pilgrims in Plymouth on uh, December 21st or December, December 27th, depending upon whom you ask. And uh, it was started in Plymouth by a, a group of men in 1769, 18th century, who, uh, remember, this was a time just before the Revolution, when people were looking for local heroes, mm -hmm. for um, uh, things to celebrate that were rooted in our continent, not in um, uh, the British Isles. So they came up with the idea of celebrating uh, the arrival of the pilgrims. And, um, of course, they didn't call them pilgrims then. They called them forefathers or old comers. So they, uh, this group of men uh, had a, a grand meal, and uh, I gather there was a lot of drinking going on because <laughs> toasting was uh, a, a, an aspect of Forefathers Day. And um, they did this at a club in, that they started in. Very elite. Uh, very elite club, yeah. yes, yes, all male, very elite. And uh, they, uh, until uh, just before the revolution where the, um, the club broke up over the issue of, of independence, some of the members were loyalists and others were um, patriots. And um, then after the war, it, they started taking it up again and it was a big deal in Plymouth, but um, it, uh, in the early 19th century, it began to spread around the country in lots of places around the country, usually New England societies in New York, in California, in at Minneapolis, and various parts of the country would hold um, a special dinner and a special or have an oration on Forefathers' Day. But the Forefathers' Day in Plymouth, uh, which is continuing, um, uh, had a tradition of having a, a, a political speaker. Uh, somebody compared giving a speech at Forefathers Day in Plymouth 
to the New Hampshire primaries. It was where people, um, up and coming politicians, would often go and uh, try out um, their ideas, and it was picked up by all the press. And um, so, Forefathers' Day still goes on. The food that is uh, associated with it is something called succotash, which you may have heard of. Uh, it's, uh, the pilgrims learned about succotash from the Wampanoag Indians. It's, uh, it's a mixture of corn and beans. And uh, when Jack and I were at a forefathers' dinner a few years ago in Plymouth, uh, there was a big tureen of succotash set out in the middle of the room at, across from the bar. And we can attest to the fact that the line at the bar was much longer. <laughs> so. So, so we're in the 18th century, mm -hmm. and, and you're getting the states are doing days of Thanksgiving, and uh, a meal has come to be associated with this, and you have things like Forefathers Day. The war comes and goes, and here we have the first Congress in George Washington, and we have another enormous controversy over Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. or whether there should be a proclamation from the president about a day of Thanksgiving. Talk about what the, I mean, it was just so wonderfully American, the objections to George Washington issuing a proclamation for Thanksgiving. This is probably the single most surprising thing I discovered in my research, which was that um, um, the idea of, a, of the president issuing a Thanksgiving proclamation was so controversial. Um, it started in the House, and this was during the first Congress. Uh, they were debating in Federal Hall in downtown Manhattan. And uh, uh, Elias uh, Budino from New Jersey proposed, issued, proposed that the House and then the Senate go to the President with this idea for, uh, that he should issue a proclamation for a first Thanksgiving. Well, the President had never issued a proclamation, and, number one. And so the debate went on, and uh, there were two main points. One group said that uh, the president didn't have the power to issue such a proclamation, <laughs> that that began, that belonged to the various states, that individual states should issue Thanksgiving proclamations, not the president. And number two, uh, they had just debated the First Amendment, and so freedom of religion was fresh in their minds, and they said that a president would be interfering in the issue of freedom of religion if he issued a proclamation, because for them, Thanksgiving had strong religious connotations. And as it turned out, uh, the proclamation, the idea uh, passed, and uh, a, a delegation from the House and the Senate went to Washington. And Washington did a brilliant thing. He, he did many brilliant things, but uh, this was one of them. He issued a proclamation. Very uh, first ever. Very first ever, yeah. And then he sent it to the governors of the states, requesting them to um, announce it in their states. That is, he didn't tell them to do it. So I think he kind of got it that uh, he, um, he was respecting the authority of, of the Congress. Later on, um, Jefferson uh, flat out refused to issue a presidential proclamation. Although he had issued them when he was governor of Virginia, he would not issue them as, um, as president. And one thing I love in the book, too, uh, Melanie unearthed, unearthed Jefferson's writing on this, in which he actually has a long debate with himself about whether or not he should issue a Thanksgiving proclamation and then the arguments for why he should not. Mm -hmm. But it's very entertaining reading, and he chose not to. And we don't have another president who does until Lincoln, correct? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, well, Madison issued a proclamation at the end of the War of 1812, and I think he also issued one of Thanksgiving f to give thanks uh, for our victory during the war, but no Thanksgiving for general purposes until... 1863. And the other interesting thing that Washington did, and you have a, a section on this in the book, is he, he issued a non-denominational oh, yeah. uh, proclamation, right? I mean, mm -hmm. this is an important because there'll be controversies over this mm -hmm. in the succeeding years. I mean, he doesn't say that this is a, a Christian 
event, but what, what does he say in that yeah, first he, one? He was very clear that it was for uh, everybody. God was mentioned, but no specific religion. And um, in one of his subsequent proclamations, he made it even more explicit that people of all faiths should join together to celebrate. And this was important because um, almost every president who issued, then went on to issue a proclamation of for Thanksgiving followed the Washington example, but not every governor did. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a marvelous case uh, in 1844 in Charleston, which had a large Jewish pop population. And uh, the Jews of Charleston refused to, cel to celebrate Thanksgiving that year. Why? Because the governor had issued an a explicitly Christian proclamation and would not um, rewrite it to include them. So uh, fortunately, that governor left office at the end of the year. And the new governor, one of his first acts was to issue a non-denominational proclamation. This was how controversial it was. It yeah. was one of his first acts as mm -hmm. new governor to fix the Thanksgiving proclamation. <laughs> Gotta like that. Okay, so my favorite part of the book, uh, my favorite person in the book, Sarah Josepha Hale. Mm. Uh, so if, raise your hand if you've ever heard this name. Sarah, okay. oh, we got one. But basically, we would probably not have Thanksgiving or not for this incredible woman mm -hmm. um, and talk about her uh, she's 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 my favorite too yeah. and um, I think uh, because she was one of America's great editors and uh, we rarely hear about her she was um, when she was in her early 30s she was from uh, Met, uh, New Hampshire she was widowed left with four children and one on the way and no means of support um, she began to write uh, and uh, very quickly uh, gained a following and was made editor of a magazine in Massachusetts. And then, soon after that, she was named editor of Godey's Ladies Book. Um, and the reason she, the, the, the sensibility she brought to Godey's was that she would publish American authors and write about American things. And this was very different from what other magazines were doing. M most magazines would steal material from um, English mag magazines and republish it for Americans. Well, it turned out that American readers had an appetite for things about America and by American writers. So she published Harriet Beecher Stowe, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and, and others. And, and this magazine, by the way, is immensely... Im become, by, by 1860, it's the most popular magazine in the country. And um, uh, with a, a third of its, popular, of its subscription in the uh, circulation in the South, she was also um, a very um, um, anti-slavery. She was a great abolitionist. And um, she had this idea beginning in the 40s that Thanksgiving would be a way to unify our country um, and um, force people north and south to think about um, what makes America great and the virtues of our political system. So at the same time that she was publishing articles about Thanksgiving, oh, and by the way, she was the first editor to publish recipes in a magazine. And she also did that as a way to encourage women to participate in Thanksgiving. Um, at the same time uh, that she was working at Godey's Lady book, Ladies Book, she wrote personal letters to hundreds of political fi and other public figures in America, encouraging them to set a, a, a date for Thanksgiving, a national date. She tried to get governors to um, uh, issue proclamations for Thanksgivings on the same date. That didn't work too well. Um, Thanksgivings were held from September to December, and so there was no coordination from state to state. But she specifically wrote to every president and tried to and made the case for why we needed a national Thanksgiving. And finally, in 1863, um, Lincoln heeded the call <laughs> and uh, decided to do so. So this is a 30 or 40 year campaign on her part mm -hmm. to have a, a one day celebrated in the country. And 
you know, it sounds from reading the book that so much of what we associate with Thanksgiving, the food, the recipes, the meals, the, the idea of family and generosity came out of the things that she published. I think that's so right. That's she created the idea to some extent of our modern Thanksgiving. Yeah, she did. She, uh, she, um, a lot of it came from her childhood in New Hampshire in the late 18th century. She would describe in her writings, and she also wrote fiction, she would describe what Thanksgiving Day was like, um, um, you know, in very great detail. Um, and um, Harriet Beecher Stowe did this too. But for example, uh, Americans um, would have Thanksgiving Day with all the food set out instead of serving it in courses as the French do, <laughs> which was considered uh, kind of not not appropriate. Freedom fries, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So there'd be two courses, one course of all different meats, including turkey, which in the 19th century came to be the, the main um, um, dish. Um, and then there would be a, a second course of all the desserts, which were usually dozens of pies. I also love, too, that she would run fiction in this magazine. Mm -hmm. She made a point of getting uh, people that uh, would write fiction in which Thanksgiving was celebrated in the, the short stories, as though that was just what everybody did. Yeah. So it was an all-out campaign. <laughs> and uh, she, was and she won. She won. She won. Uh, Lincoln issues the proclamation. At that point, every president since him has issued a Thanksgiving mm -hmm. proclamation. And we, as a country, move. Now, did his... Name the last Thursday. He did. He did. So and, he came up with that. It, yes. No, no. Well, no. He followed Washington's example. Washington's example. So the yep. last Thursday of November, yep. um, we begin to to coalesce around this, and then comes. So if Sarah Joseph Hale is my favorite character in the book, my favorite story in the book is uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who manages to mess up Thanksgiving. <laughs> okay. You know, well, along with the rest of the economy, he manages to. To mess up Thanksgiving. So to tell us about how FDR managed to throw the entire country in an outrage over Thanksgiving. Well, there might be one or two people in the room who were uh, who are old enough to have a vague memory of this. But in 1939, Franklin Roosevelt gave a press conference announcing he was changing the date of Thanksgiving. <laughs> and now um, he wanted to move it up a week so that his, his very uh, dubious theor uh, theory was that if he added a week to the Christmas shopping season, that people would spend more money and therefore it would jumpstart the economy. New Deal economics. Right. <laughs> well, of course, people would have been only too happy to spend more money, but they didn't have more money, so it was a flop. But for three years, the date was um, the date that the president announced was a week early. Now, the states, of course, um, I, there was no law. They didn't have to go along with the president, so they didn't. And you had a situation where half of the states decided to celebrate Thanksgiving on the traditional date, and the other half celebrated on Franklin Roosevelt's date, which came to be called Franksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finally, um, in 1941, uh, oh, I should also mention that um, the people who spoke out most aggressively uh, about uh, Roosevelt's stupid proposal were uh, football coaches uh, of colleges, because colleges had their football uh, seasons all lined up well in advance, and usually they played their championship games on Thanksgiving weekend. So um, anyway, in 41, uh, he decided that starting in 42, they would go back to the traditional date. Um, yeah, the uh, government statistics showed that it wasn't working, and the outcry was too high. <laughs> um, also. Oh, yes, 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 I'm sorry. The big thing was, yeah, Jack just reminded me. Um, Congress, of course, got into the act and decided that it was going to pass a law making on, on what the date of Thanksgiving should be. And so they ended up naming it as the fourth Thursday of November. And Roosevelt signed it into law the day after Christmas in 1941. Making it finally an official national yes. holiday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And I also love, too, apparently, along with the football coaches, the most bitter, angry complainants that exist were the calendar makers <laughs> who had uh, uh, made their calendars a year in advance and were very furious that they might have to reprint them. Yeah. There are also, Melanie has, uh, in all throughout the book, so many wonderful quotes from people about Thanksgiving, but she had a couple of great ones in this chapter about the FDR deal. Uh, she had a uh, Senator Stiles Bridges of New Hampshire when this all came out. He said, has the president given any thought to abolishing winter? <laughs> and then, uh -huh. There was also a Republican governor of Wyoming who said that at least, quote, this is one program the president has demanded, which is not imposing any additional tax on the taxpayers. <laughs> so they managed to make it political. <laughs> yeah, they did. And uh, there even was one fellow who compared, one, who compared him to Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> so. It was Landon, wasn't it? It was Landon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who Landon. had lost to him in the recent election. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to talk about some of the things that go around now that we have this official national holiday. We've got to that point in the story. Some of the things that have gone around it, the traditions that go with it. You mentioned football. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think a lot of people would be surprised to learn from here that I mean, football and Thanksgiving, their, their beginnings are sort of totally intermingled. Mm -hmm. The first uh, collegiate football game was 1869 between uh, Rutgers and Princeton. And Princeton, uh, Kim and I are both Princetonians, so I'm sorry to say uh, uh, Princeton lost, Rutgers won. Uh, and then a few years later, uh, Princeton and Yale faced off in the first Thanksgiving Day game. It was a success, and starting around 1880, um, that game moved to New York City, where it became a phenomenon. And from New York, style center of the country, it moved across the country. And by 1890, there were uh, uh, 5,000 Thanksgiving games going on on Thanksgiving Day. So um, this created a big stir among a lot of people. They thought that it was inappropriate to devote one's day to watching football, and uh, rather than um, family or church. But uh, needless to say, football Sports won. won. Sports football won. won. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, uh, not to our um, alma mater's credit, that uh, Princeton-Yale game was so rowdy, mm. and the students were so badly behaved that at a couple of years into this, they forced it to be back on campus, right? Yeah, the faculty decided. This was an age when faculty actually cared about the moral development <laughs> of students as well as uh, uh, the academic development, they decided um, they were going to bring the game back onto campus because uh, it was inappropriate for Yaleys and Princetonians to behave in such uh, a way. You, you know, you, you bring together, one of the things that Melanie makes a point of in this book, which I love, is that Thanksgiving, uh, as an American concept, that, that you really won't find any holiday like this anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have days of thanks, you, you, you have... Uh, all kinds of different religious ceremonies uh, of one kind or another, but to have one that has come to encompass all the things that Thanksgiving encompasses in the United States, which is not just football and not just a meal and not just church, but generosity. You know, uh, Melanie notes that, uh, you know, one of the things that Washington did when he also issued his proclamation was he donated some money to a local church to help the poor. And this is also a thing that has come to be associated with Americans and Thanksgiving is, is Americans' generous spirit and things we do on the day of Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that, the generosity question, but other sort of aspects of this very American holiday, as you call it. Yeah. Um, generosity was, um, I devoted a whole chapter to that because I found it so interesting and so classically American. Um, the first instance of it was uh, in 1636, but then I would trace it through the centuries to just a few years ago and the 92nd Street Y, a Jewish organization in New York City, um, started something called Giving Tuesday. It's an online um, um, collaboration where uh, organizations uh, ask um, for donations and people can band together and seek donations for good causes and this all takes place on the Tuesday after Thanksgiving but uh, and you think of the millions of Americans who volunteer at food banks or um, other uh, uh, Thanksgiving dinners or uh, other things having to do with helping the poor or the imprisoned um, on 
Thanksgiving Day. So there is a long tradition of that. And the military, the, yeah, the military, there's a, a long tradition of that too, making sure that the military and military families have um, a uh, Thanksgiving Day dinner. Um, and, uh, but some of the other virtues, let me think. Well, religious, for sure, mm -hmm. um, even though the holiday, people often say to me Thanksgiving isn't a religious holiday. Well, that's not really right. It is a religious holiday, but it's that rarest of religious holidays, which is that it's for every religion and or for people of no faith at all. It's what you want to make of it. And there are not many um, churches or other houses of worship that are open on Thanksgiving Day anymore. We don't have a tradition of going to a church or another house of worship on Thanksgiving Day, but there are lots of Thanksgiving services during the week. And um, I also discovered that there was one survey, this is a little oblique, but uh, there was one survey that showed a few years ago that around 49% of Americans say grace before a meal. And another 40-some percent said that they would on special occasions. So I, that means, uh, if you extrapolate a little bit, that on Thanksgiving Day, uh, close to 100% of Americans are saying, uh, giving thanks to God on um, Thanksgiving Day. And then there are other ways that people say thanks, uh, give thanks. Um, there are traditions of people going around the dinner table and asking each person to say something that he or she is thankful for. Um, in the uh, appendix, in appendix to the book, I have a bunch of short readings about Thanksgiving Day over the centuries, and I included a, an atheist benediction for Thanksgiving that um, somebody wrote a few years ago. So um, that's that's another example. Yeah, last year at Thanksgiving, we went around to say our thanks, and my four-year-old gave thanks that God had created the color pink. So. Oh. <laughs> She's a girl. <laughs> She's a girl. <laughs> um, I, I want to get to questions, um, but before we do, and while people think of your questions, get them all ready to go, um, Melanie has, as she mentioned, she's included all of these lovely um, little excerpts of writing that people have done over the years, their views on Thanksgiving, from people as ranging as Laura Ingalls Wilder to Winston Churchill, um, and they're all collected in the book, as well as recipes. Mm. Um, and, and so while everyone gets their questions ready, I, we, we can't go on without you at least telling us what some of your favorite of those writings are in here, and what you and Jack will be doing to celebrate oh, your Thanksgiving. Oh, well, I'll answer the last question first. Uh, Jack will be roasting our turkey. He's uh, the he's the man in charge of turkey. My kind of guy, <laughs> right? And we'll be celebrating at our home in Connecticut. Um, my favorite reading. I don't know. There are so many. I loved the one um, by uh, Louisa May Alcott about family and Thanksgiving. But I also loved Benjamin Franklin, who talked about it as being a day of public felicity where we celebrate, um, uh, we give thanks for Americans, America's freedom, civic and religious. And I think of that one especially when I think about Thanksgiving this year. And the reason is that uh, we are in this divisive moment in our history uh, and um, with a political discourse that is really quite ugly. And in a few weeks, we will all go to the polls. But then a couple of weeks after that, we will, I hope, as a united people, sit down at the Thanksgiving table. And that in some sense, Thanksgiving will be a healing moment for all of us. Well, you'll have an even better chance of that if you get Melanie's book. So anyway, questions out there? Melanie, you? Yes. Al Milliken, AM Media. I was curious, what was the, I mean, what do you know about the reasoning or thinking, uh, the, the praying or whatever of Abraham Lincoln to choose to do it in 1863? Did he consider it before that? And I'm wondering, did the Confederacy have any response 
to him having that proclamation? Um, Lincoln had issued a couple of uh, Thanksgiving proclamations uh, earlier for specific military victories uh, during the uh, Civil War, as did uh, Jefferson Davies. So there, uh, they had, what's the word, revived the Thanksgiving, uh, the idea of a presidential Thanksgiving proclamation. Both of them had. Um, I don't know what the South's reaction was to it. Um, other than um, their, um, we know of um, Union soldiers celebrating Thanksgiving in parts of the South, but beyond that, I, I don't know. He had been thinking about, um, uh, and the extraordinary thing about the, the, the 16, 1863 proclamation is um, that it, was, it made no mention of a military victory. Um, it was shortly after Gettysburg, so it was arguably the bloodiest year in American history, and yet he didn't talk about the war. He just talked about um, the blessings of the country, and it was, it's not the first thing that would have come to mind to anybody, any American who was thinking about that year. Yes, it was explicitly exclusive. It explicitly included the, the Southerners as well. Uh, yes, sir, in the back. Uh -huh. I'm here because when I got the promo from the Hudson Institute, I saw this portrait of the pilgrims. And as a, uh, a son of Virginia, I uh, <laughs> my concern, Houstonian <laughs> as I am, uh, that this possible error might creep into the conversation. I, I, was, uh, I was delighted to hear your comments about uh, Berkeley Plantation. Uh, during my tenure as Attorney General of Virginia, I spoke at Berkeley on occasion on Thanksgiving Day, and uh, that's not the purpose I'm, I'm here for. It's really to correct the historical record, and because I didn't realize there was any controversy any longer about where the first Thanksgiving was. I mean, you mentioned Texas. Of course, they spoke Spanish at the Texas celebrations in those days, uh, the same in Florida, another Spanish colony. Uh, but the first English-speaking Thanksgiving uh, was in Berkeley, and just um, because I uh, am amused by all of this, as you can tell, <laughs> uh, I, to, to set the record straight, um, um, obviously Schlesinger had a great sense of humor because I'm confident he wrote the proclamation, the second proclamation of President Kennedy, and he referred to this unconquerable New England biases, I think he referred to on the part of the White House staff, which he was seeking to correct. Mm -hmm. However, Kennedy was in a somewhat embarrassing position in the sense that he was um, a son of Massachusetts. And to disavow Massachusetts, obviously, might have created some political problems back home. <laughs> so the proclamation, as you correctly say, uh, talks about over three centuries ago, Virginia and Massachusetts <laughs> celebrated Thanksgiving, with Virginia being named first. Um, I, uh, for those of you who uh, may not know where Berkeley is, you should look at the uh, uh, Sunday edition of the Washington Post, which had a, a series of on uh, homes of presidents, the first <laughs> seven of which were all in Virginia. I hasten to add, just to make sure nobody's forgotten that. Uh, but uh, uh, Berkeley is uh, uh, on the James River, not far from here, the birthplace of one of Virginia's presidents, uh, Harrison. And uh, I would encourage you to go there. It's uh, an absolutely delightful place, which is now open to the public. So thank you very much for hearing me out. <laughs> thank you. Well, I'll, See, there put it, you go. I'll put it on the list. Yeah. Uh, yes, the lady in the back row, please. Uh -huh. Certainly, excuse me, interesting pieces you're putting together. But I was interested uh, in the picture and what uh, the first Thanksgiving to say something about the Indians because they seem to be, we're thankful, but they seem to, to have been the people who lost the most. Uh, I have a chapter in my book about this subject. Uh, it's uh, titled Day of Mourning. The, uh, the actual first Thanksgiving was a very hopeful time. And it really was a time of, of peace and hospitality and neighborliness. And I think it pointed to the um, diverse country we have become. Uh, 
But that peaceful period ended a few decades later. And of course, um, there is the tragic history of Native Americans uh, that followed. And I interviewed some Native Americans for that chapter. There are two groups, uh, one, on, uh, one in Plymouth and another on the West Coast, um, on Alcatraz, that have alternate Thanksgivings on the holiday. Um, the Plymouth group is the most um, aggressive. The, and it, for example, they fast um, on Thanksgiving Day until the end of the day, and then they gather for a communal meal. In California, it started out as an un-Thanksgiving, but over the years, they've changed. And in fact, I think it, that Thanksgiving has, it's more like what the pilgrims and the Indians did. They gather at dawn on Alcatraz. There are hundreds of people who attend this, and um, they have a spiritual ceremony. Um, and then um, about 9 o'clock, they get back on the ferry and return to San Francisco many, in time so that many of them can put a turkey in the oven and have a, a, a Thanksgiving celebration. The woman who runs it uh, grows her own pumpkins for pumpkin pies. And she said that um, her group had decided that uh, it was important to focus on us gathering together as Americans. That said, um, in the uh, Native American community, there is a lot of dissatisfaction with the way Thanksgiving is portrayed in elementary schools, which is about the only place it's taught. It's not taught very much in high school. Um, but in elementary schools, uh, the example that the two examples that seem to and I uh, uh, um, I value what they said uh, that se seem to really upset them are one the wearing of feathers to seeing children in these Thanksgiving pageants wearing huge headdresses and they say the weather the wearing of feathers in uh, Indian traditions uh, is very sacred and that they think that that's not uh, appropriate. And number two, the treatment of Squanto, uh, who is the um, uh, Indian who helped the pilgrims. And Squanto um, is uh, you know, always presented as a very positive force, as he was. But at the same time, he has a very tragic history. He was twice kidnapped from North America um, and once taken to London and the second time taken to Spain, where he was sold as a slave. Both times, he rather incredibly found his way back to Plymouth. And this is prior to the Pilgrims' this arrival. Is pri this is prior to the Pilgrims' arrival, yes. Thank you for clarifying that. So it, it, um, um, there is a chapter that explores that issue. Yes. Perhaps a lighter note. Wait, wait for the mic. I think of the bounty of all the food the turkey, the apple, pumpkin pies, etc. Uh, could you speak of some of the quirky and unusual foods that we partake of or we should go back to, perhaps, for Thanksgiving? Sure. Uh, that was the most fun chapter to write, I must say, the history of dinner. And then the recipe section at the end of the book. Um, we, uh, if you want to eat what the pilgrims ate, you would probably have venison, oysters, and corn for, for dinner, because we know that those foods were on the menu. There are two, eyewit two eyewitness accounts of, of Thanksgiving, the first Thanksgiving, and turkey is mentioned in one of them, but it's in the context of other fowl as well. And we know that they ate such things as eagle and seagull and uh, other not so delicious sounding um, creatures. So turkey might have been on the menu. But um, as the years went by, there are not a lot of reports of, of, of the meal, except I did found, find a few. There was one in Georgia, <coughs> which included turkey and ham, I think. There was another, uh, and I love this, at the end of the 17th century, where um, a man recorded in a, his diary uh, his Thanksgiving menu, and it included bear and venison. 
No cranberries. Uh, Jack reminds me of cranberries. Cranberries would not have been on the menu because the Plymouth, uh, the, the settlers from Plymouth uh, did not have sugar, which was very expensive. And they, they would not have had pie either because they didn't have flour. But they might have eaten a, um, a variation of pie uh, using local pumpkins. Um, and, oh gosh, the, uh, the thing that really surprised me was in the, 19th cent in the 18th and 19th centuries, the traditional New England um, uh, Thanksgiving dinner always included a chicken pot pie. And I guess every family had chickens. Uh, and anyway, it was just a, a very popular, a very popular dish into the 19th century, into the 19th century, uh, into the 20th century, pardon me. You see references to it as well. Turkey became popular and very widespread in the 19th century because it, uh, it, it became less expensive. It still wasn't cheap, though. So you, I would find uh, newspaper reports of, uh, that would give a, a, a Thanksgiving menu that included a turkey. But then they would say, for those of you who don't have um, turkey pocketbooks, here's uh, a menu that included chicken or beef. Um, so uh, not everybody could afford a turkey. Wasn't there also a, a Thanksgiving oyster craze? Oh, yes, yes. Oysters were very cheap in the, in, uh, up until the early part of the 20th century. So oysters were very popular, especially oyster stuffing was popular. Um, and uh, uh, I know that's a tradition in a, lot of, in a number of families. I know, especially if they're from New England, and I'm also told from like the, the Washington State area where oysters were, were inexpensive, that was, a, a tradition grew up there as well. My only regret is that you did not have a chapter, but you can do this in a second edition on the art of deep frying a turkey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, sir, with the orange tie, pink tie. <laughs> Is there any evidence that the um, political correctness, which has seeped down, I'm sure, even to elementary schools now, is that starting to put a chill or kind of putting a spin on, on the traditional understanding of Thanksgiving? Uh, I'm happy to report that uh, the answer is mostly no. Uh, I think that's because people like the holidays so much. And um, if a, a college kid started to um, complain his parents would uh, slap them down <laughs> but but there is you do see uh, you do see a little bit of it and I, I describe that in my book there um, are uh, and it's mostly in the um, university community um, an occasional professor complains about Thanksgiving and calls for a boycott um, occasional student writes an email um, complaining about it but uh, it hasn't gone the way of Columbus Day for sure, uh, and I don't see any evidence that that's likely to happen anytime soon. One thing I should just point out, it's, it's worth knowing, Melanie had mentioned earlier that, you know, the only place that people learn about Thanksgiving is grade school, and I would note that this is the very first book ever that is an education on Thanksgiving for anyone older than the age of eight. <laughs> so, well, I think there's an, there's one academic book, but the first, uh, yeah. So. Anybody else? The gentleman in blue. Mm -hmm. uh, related, to the, related to the last question, uh, could you say a few words about where Thanksgiving is going? And I'm thinking about things like references uh, we have so often to Turkey Day and the president pardoning a turkey and, and so on. I don't see, I, I, you know, I think Thanksgiving is probably going to stay where it is for a while. The, I don't see the turkey tradition disappearing anytime soon, though you hear a lot more references to vegetarian options than you once did. Um, uh, the religious aspects of Thanksgiving have changed the most over the years, but as I mentioned earlier, I think they've developed in a, in a different way. Um, and Americans still see Thanksgiving as a day of gratitude. Um, one thing I 
suggest in my book, I, I would like to see a revival of a tradition called Five Kernels of Corn, and I would, I would like to make this a new tradition for Thanksgiving. In the 19th century, it was popular to put five kernels of dried corn on the Thanksgiving table. And it was um, in memory of the pilgrims and the Indians, uh, the starving time for the pilgrims and the corn symbolizing the generosity of the Wampanoan people who taught them how to grow corn. And I, I, and I think it would be uh, meaningful if we could somehow revive that tradition. Okay. Yes. A Wall Street Journal question. Well, how did the Black Friday shopping craze begin? In ah, uh, well, uh, I do talk this. about that. And you may be disappointed to know that it, uh, it, uh, uh, the genesis of it was a traffic jam. <laughs> in, in Philadelphia, um, the Army-Navy game used to be held um, the day after Thanksgiving. And it also was a day of shopping, and suburbanites would go into the city to shop and oh, see a parade as well. This was, and so a reporter for the Philadelphia Evening Star, now defunct, wrote a story about um, the dreadful traffic on that day, and he dubbed it Black Friday. And then it, it's, it continued over the years, it caught on. And um, that's how we got the name Black Friday. Um, I'm, I also give a boost in the book to um, the whole I idea of Black Friday, which I think is good for our economy and good for us. Um, you know, a lot of people say it's a c contrast between the giving holiday of Thanksgiving and the greedy holiday of, of, of um, Black Friday. And I, I don't quite buy that because um, in a prosperous economy where we have the money to buy, go out and spend money, and often buying gifts for other people. We also, it also makes it possible for us to give to uh, needy, to worthy causes, which of course uh, we do no more so than in the giving season between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, this is a, a, another menu question. Um, I was curious, uh, uh, in follow up on an earlier question, I was curious what happened when uh, various immigrant groups came to the country um, from Central Europe in the, in the mid 19th century and from Southern and Eastern Europe. Did, uh, was there any kind of attempt to replace turkey, for example, as the, as, the, as the main meal? Or did everyone just simply go, pretty quickly go along with that as the menu? It was very hard to research that. I did ask that question. Um, but I'll, I'll, it's, the immig immigrants throughout our history have adopted the holiday for sure. And whether or not they, that included turkey, I don't know. But um, a couple of years ago, and I tell this story in the introduction to my book, I visited Newcomers High School, which is a high school in Queens for uh, immigrant children. And I, uh, they, when I went there, there were, I think, 850 students, and they spoke something like 60 languages. And they were all learning English and learning about uh, you know, the regular curriculum, too. And I spoke to several classes and, and asked them about Thanksgiving. They were all about to celebrate their first or second Thanksgiving. And um, uh, some of them talked about the, f everyone was going to celebrate it. And some of them talked about the, the family foods that they were going to include on the menu. So then I asked, well, do you have to have a turkey? And the kids literally screamed at me, yes, it's tradition. <laughs> so uh, for that group of kids at that particular moment, Turkey was required. Oh, yes. I was wondering if you could visualize this as a video or perhaps a 
infomercial series or some documentary and how what would you like to see in that if someone were to pick pick this up and say would we like to sponsor you to do discovery channel series on this uh oh gosh i would love to think about that um i'm a word person so i've been focusing on words but um i i think there is a, it, i think it's a rich store of there's a rich store of material there and um it could make a wonderful set of videos, um, but I'd, I'd want to think about that more before I before I answered. Doug, mm -hmm. thanks for the terrific talk. Uh, two two questions. One is the expression "as American as apple pie." Uh, one of the more astonishing things I found in your book was what you had to say about that. Uh, 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 about that phrase, and the other question is, if you, I, I'd like you to elaborate on the issue of charity. I mean, you you touched on it that that there, are, uh, uh, that giving charity has been part of the holiday for a long time, including when George Washington uh, issued his first Thanksgiving proclamation. But could you say something about? America and charity and how Americans stack up against the rest of the world uh, in the giving of charity. Yeah, well, um, I have the numbers in the book, uh, courtesy of, of, of philanthropy, what is Adam Meyerson's name? Roundtable, but courtesy of the philanthropy roundtable, which just did a, a survey of this. And Americans are by far the most generous people in the world, and beyond that, Individual Americans are remarkably generous. Most other countries don't have a tradition of individual giving. And um, the tradition of individual giving has been enhanced by Thanksgiving. It's, uh, you see it th throughout, um, throughout our history. One example I, that's in the book that I came across was um, the in Thanksgiving in Washington, D.C. in 1864, so it was the second national Thanksgiving in the modern series. And um, they were feeding, there were Thanksgiving dinners at all the hospitals for the wounded. And um, much of the money to supply the food came from individual donations, very small donations that had been collected for them. Um, and there's illustration after illustration of these small homegrown charities that Americans create to help people in their community, and no more so than around Thanksgiving. As for apple pie, um, we didn't have apples here until uh, later on in the 17th century. So there were no apples at the first Thanksgiving. And uh, ap apple pie, uh, of course, caught on, and it was very much a part of the Thanksgiving celebration. But um, in the eight, 1960s, a um, wonderful uh, food writer uh, by the name of Clementine Paddleford went around the country and interviewed home cooks and looked at their recipe books, some of which went back for generations and asked about Thanksgiving dinner. And the reply in New England was, oh gosh, no, we can't serve apple pie for Thanksgiving. It's too ordinary. So, but one pie that was very popular, I read historically, was something called Marlboro pie. And it was a fancy kind of apple pie. It had a lemon custard in it mm. and, uh, and apples. So that was considered good enough for Thanksgiving dinner. Doesn't kind of have the same ring, though, right? No, it's American no, no. Marlboro <laughs> pie. <Right. laughs> so. One more question. All right, then I'm gonna I'm gonna say thank you to Melanie and to Kimberly for a delightful discussion, a, a rediscovery of something we thought we knew about but didn't, and uh, makes it deeper. Um, uh, my own my own re recollections of Thanksgiving included that the feasting, the thanks, and the Detroit Lions playing the Green Bay Pack <laughs> in Michigan. Uh, but um, uh, I want to suggest uh, an opportunity to bo both purchase this book here, but for those who are joining us online, of course, there are many ways to buy the book. And I'd like to suggest that you not only buy it for yourself, but it makes a great gift, uh, uh, not only for uh, family members and, and others, but in a few weeks, 
you can maybe bind up the wounds in your neighborhood by going to that neighbor who has that yard sign you hate or who has your yard <laughs> sign and offer them an opportunity to, to pull together on the basis of a great tradition and to learn a little bit more about it. And if you have recipes in here, you might even get something back. So uh, uh, let me suggest that you buy more than one copy and use it. And thank you, Melanie, for giving thank us you. this gift. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.